Everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balcavage and Dr. Erica Riggleman. We're back for another edition of Thyroid Answers Podcast. Dr. Riggleman, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. Fantastic. Uh, we have a special guest on today. This is uh, Alex Stewart. She's coming to us from down under. Uh, <laughs> she has a, uh, a whole uh, world or a whole life centered around low toxicity. So she's got the Low Tox podcast. She's got the Low, to low Tox website. She's got the Low Tox life book. She has everything Low Tox. So if you've got toxicity issues, and this will tailor right into the podcast we did the other day of how uh, toxicity is a, a challenge and a problem in our life and how it impacts not just thyroid physiology, but really every aspect of, of our physiology. So Absolutely. Alex, welcome to the Thyroid Answers podcast. How are you today? I'm really great. Thank you. I'm wrapping up my day just as you guys are kicking off yours. Um, had an, a mean session of tennis this evening, a great finish to the week, and I'm ready to chat to you guys. Awesome. awesome. So you've got the low tox life ensemble of things going on but and you're primarily australia but now you're kind of trying to take over the u.s so why don't you <laughs> give the u.s listeners and the people who aren't australian who don't who maybe don't know you uh, a little bit of background about you how you got into the space um and and then we can dive into some uh, really good questions on how our lives are surrounded by toxins and how they may impact our physiology Thanks, Eric and Erica. Uh, I am uh, someone who has always been quite justice oriented, right? So I was that kid who was head of the environment committee. I joined Greenpeace first day of uni. My teenage bedroom had, uh, you know, I had, had done a Martin Luther King mural, prejudice is ignorance. And I just wanted the world to be a better place as so many young people do. And then what happens, a lot of us get into our 20s, start working, you get the serious partner, you start thinking about that societal checklist and it just kind of takes over your life if you're not careful. And, uh, and during that time, I went from being an executive in the cosmetics industry to having what I call a quarter life crisis where you ditch the boyfriend, ditch the job, do the whole like cleanse, age 25, 26 and realize, so much about yourself was built up in this societal checklist that it's almost like I was on a, and I don't, you know, so many young people go through this. You're doing everything you think you should do before you are old enough to know how to critically think through your choices in life. And, um, and so I did the logical thing that every ex-executive of 26 tender years old would do. I started bartending and singing in nightclubs. And my mum was so thrilled <laughs> with that career pivot. But uh, I, in, I was allergic to the cosmetics industry. I didn't understand what that meant at the time. But all I knew was that there was something viscerally propelling me out of the job I was in. And it was one of my first retrospective realizations that when I left the cosmetics industry, I also left the life of migraines. And I, you know, I've not got a science background at that point in time. I had no idea what that correlation even was. I was just so excited to be not there anymore. Anyway, trucking along through the, the next few years, my tonsillitis gets worse and worse. I start to get tonsillitis four or five times a year. I join that merry-go-round that so many people are on where you go to the doctor, you get your drugs, you get better for a couple of months. Then you go back to the doctor, same issue, get the drugs. Oh, we've got to put you on some stronger ones now. You've been getting this for a while. And, you know, I, I talk about that in talks and I say, you know, has anyone else been on that? And half the hands rooms go up. So you know, you guys would know well what antibiotic resistance is doing to uh, our, our planet, our people. And, uh, and I got to the point where I was on the third round of the strongest antibiotics you could be on for strep throat and it did nothing. And that was scary. You know, I always thought you could just go to the doctor, get the pills, get better. And one day it happened that that wasn't the case. And I was lying there in my little one bedroom flat and a girlfriend was visiting me that night and she brought me some soup and she saw me like spitting into a bottle because I couldn't bear the pain of swallowing. Mm. And, uh, and she said, look, I know this sounds crazy, but have you like maybe thought about going to see a naturopath? And, you know, age 28, 15 years ago, I had no idea what a naturopath was. 
uh, over um, in the States, you guys have naturopathic physicians. Here we have naturopaths who do more of a health sciences degree um, rather than the doctor's degree to complement that um, modality. But anyway, I found one and she was an amazing woman. She'd been practicing for 25 years. She said, okay, I'm just going to send you home with these herbs. You need to take them a few times a day, this much. And I just want you having brown rice, chicken stock, really well cooked carrots and nothing else for three days. Just keep it very, very simple. I was like, okay, I can, I can do that. And uh, I took the herbs, disgusting as they tasted at the time. I'd never taken anything like it. And I got better. I just sweated like, you know, I was schwitzing for days and then boom, it's like I came out of a cloud and I didn't have strep throat anymore. And I went back to her and I was like, what did you do? So I just helped your body heal itself from the inside out, gave it the tools it needed. And I was like, oh, what did I just, that was a complete flip for me as a very conventional eyes closed, convenience child of the 80s kind of life that I'd led to that point. And she said, look, you know, in the research, there seems to be more and more evidence stacking up for people having something called gluten sensitivity that's non-celiac. And there seems to be a correlation between it and the streptococcus bug family. So if we could maybe try not being on gluten for a few months and see if the tonsillitis comes back or doesn't come back, it'd be an interesting experiment if you're up for it. Now I'm half French. That was the worst news of my life right. <laughs> to be told not to be able to have poisson, quiche, all, you know, baguettes. There's like, you know, runs in our veins. And, uh, and, but I, you know, I thought I've been so sick. This is ridiculous. It's impairing my life. It's meaning I can't go to work every four weeks for a few days. It's nuts. And so I tried it. And in doing that, I had to look for wheat, barley, oats, and rye on the back of everything. I had to actually look at what I was buying and what was in it. And I very quickly started to realize that it wasn't just wheat, barley, oats and rye that I had to look for. I had to look for hydrolyzed vegetable proteins. I had to look for glucose. I had to look for sometimes, you know, dextrins and starches and all these things that could be made from these gluten containing grains. And for the very first time in my life, I was like, oh my God. God, what have I been eating? Like, what even is this stuff? I had never thought about it. As one of those people who genuinely was thankful to the food industry for packaging my breakfast up in a neat little, you know, box and um, making it so easy for me to be eating my breakfast um, right. on the run. You know, all of that messaging just fed right into my psyche so so perfectly which they want right that's exactly right. what they want but it's making us sick and i started to realize this as i got better and better and better simply abstaining from what i don't believe necessarily is just gluten but all of the crap that came with the packaged food i could no longer eat because there was also gluten in there so it really you know it was a double win in terms of what i was removing from my diet for me and i don't believe gluten's evil i don't think everyone needs to be off it um you know there are some incredible ways to enjoy whole grains properly and traditionally prepared but for a large portion of us it seems to be inflammatory and you know if you could get a bit creative and learn to do other things then why not? And uh, I see it as a gift because it actually got me learning how to cook. As a Frenchie who didn't want to give up taste and flavor, I had to figure out how to make a beautiful quiche with gluten-free grains and flours. So I started using almond meals and coconut flours and how they work together and joining, you know, putting a little bit of tapioca in. And I got really excited. And that's really one of the infant stages of the low-tox life being born, just starting to help people realize that if they've been told they have to quit gluten, it's going to be okay, guys. You can right. use these beautiful nourishing flowers instead. You can still have the odd treat and on a birthday and a family barbecue and, uh, and then just enjoy good whole food because this, the further I went into my investigation, I didn't want to be there like with an app and, you know, typing in all the numbers, trying to figure out if that, if that additive was safe or not. I just thought, screw all this stuff in the middle. I'm just going to shop the produce section. I don't even need to do much guesswork there. But right. then, of course, 
you have to ask yeah, about the farmer and how it's, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a piece by piece journey. And for anyone out there who is just starting out, um, it really is about developing a vocab and it takes a while to get that vocab happening. So please be patient with yourself. If you sometimes, you know, you listen to podcasts and they can be really intense. It's a whole bunch of new information. Just step back to the most comfortable part of what you heard. Start there and slowly step your way forward would be my first piece of advice tonight. So um, I, I love your your journey and your story, how you you had to educate yourself. And I think that that's I did. important to, to understand and for people to, to you know, because I tell people all the time, yes, let's, let's try to reduce toxicity. Let's get off the gluten. Let's get off the processed food. And they are like, well, why? I don't know. They don't understand why mm. it's really hard. And so you taking that initiative to learn and make that next step, I think is huge in you realizing what is all this stuff? I don't even know what this is. Why am I putting this mm. in my body? Usually once that light switch flicks, people get it and they become mm. more motivated. They want to learn, they want to cook. It's getting people to, to flip that switch, I think is really huge. It's Most my people, favorite they, thing to do for people. I love it. it. But often people get into this realm and they become very overwhelmed and they think mm. everything is bad. So I'm afraid, to, I'm afraid to do this and I'm afraid to eat that. I'm afraid to buy this. What advice do you give people to, who are starting out in this journey to not get overwhelmed? Mm, it's such a great question, right? Because, you know, if you think about our diet culture and it's been going for a while now, like I was a child of the Oprah generation and my mom was just joining a new diet. Like every few months we were doing Suzanne powder and then we were on the next one and all of our food changed at home. So I remember that, but I remember her pouring over all these books and trying to get it right. And then you sort of realize it's hard and then you realize you're not doing it as well as your friend. And then you start to feel guilty, shame, all that kind of stuff. And I just think guilt and shame, we have no time for that when really we have to honor the fact that we're doing our best and we're actually moving forward. Even if it's the, big, the tiniest little baby step, we have to honor that that's an awesome thing that we're doing, moving forward one little step. Um, so when you feel overwhelmed, for me, the best thing you can do is to go back to the last place you felt comfortable and just maybe add something slightly more incremental rather than feeling like, oh my gosh, I've got to cut like all cheese or, you know, if cheese is your favorite food, that's going to be really tough. And we actually talked about this when you were on my show, Eric, about the baby steps that sometimes you need to work on. Yes, that might be the end goal for that person because their biochemistry or a particular allergy they have or whatever, but how does it look this week? What does it look like today? You know, could you go for a cheese-free toasty at the, you know, tennis club instead of having the usual melted cheese on it and just start there? Maybe think about removing the processed bread next week or next month you kind of i think it's about really celebrating your wins and making your wins quite small so you feel like there are wins going on the board and i will also say in in terms of motivation and getting enough fire in the belly because that's a big issue like if you just touched on it then erica when you said sometimes there's so much to take in and the overwhelm steps in i prefer anger I think it's a much more effective emotion uh, in this journey, right? So I'll give you an example. I remember I loved, um, you guys have M&Ms, right? I think they even come from the States originally. I it's loved, really the, bad stuff. <laughs> yeah. bad, I bad loved the peanut M&Ms. They were, they were, they were so good um, with their crispy little shell, the pretty bright colors Never mind all the petroleum and, and everything I learned about them. But what I decided to do was, I was like, I'm going to find something to hate about these. And so I just studied everything. I studied what the colors were, how the colors were made. I studied the type of chocolate it was, the child labor and slavery that was behind, happening behind closed doors. I looked at uh, peanut farming and the amount of toxins and mold that can be found in, in that type of farming. Then I looked at the um, statements, uh, the annual income report statements of the CEOs of that company. 
the shareholder uh, statements and I started to realize, whoa, the CEOs are earning like $50 million a year and then they've got child slaves. Like this is the most horrific, tiny little confectionery ever. And so instead of it being, no, I shouldn't, I'm trying to cut down, like I'm trying to be really good right now, I'll say no to the M&Ms, it becomes as if I would flipping touch that and everything it represents. So I think a bit of anger can be really healthy when we actually look at the biggest possible picture of the things we're trying to move away from to motivate us to go oh look at that beautiful tomato salad fresh and that gorgeous farmer dave and his wife made this stuff and it's just all so warm and fuzzy right when you compare the two and that can be a really exciting wake up for people alex you must have missed the, the commercials on tv because usually it's the dancing m&m with his pants down oh something. yeah no i remember the little guys with the white gloves <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me let me, let me take a, a little step back here. So for yeah. our listeners, right, they're struggling with thyroid issues. They're doctors maybe who are trying to help people with thyroid issues. Maybe their thyroid is, they've been told they don't have a thyroid issue. Maybe they've kind of learned what we've learned that, hey, thyroid physiology really starts in the cell and that when we start to have symptoms, it's a cellular issue. But now we jumped into this toxicity thing, like, and we're mm. talking about food, but let's kind of break this down a little bit. Why? You know, we, we typically talk about stressors, physical stressors, chemical stressors, emotional stressors, microbial stressors. So we're talking maybe more along the line of environmental, chemical mm. stressors, right? When we're talking low tox life. Why would you tell most people that, hey, there is a concern about what you're consuming and eating? Why is that important from a health standpoint? Like there are some people who are over, as Erica said, just over the top neurotic about not getting toxic anything. And yeah. they're more like, it's no big deal. You know, you only live once, twinkie, twinkie, right? So <laughs> why is this so important? If you could just give like in a, a very short, like why is it important to be concerned about the, to the, the toxics, the chemicals in your food, in your life, in your surroundings? Why is that so important? Well, I like to think about how the human body was designed and the kind of world it was designed to live in. And it was a very different world to the world we live in now, especially the world of the last hundred years of so-called progress. Uh, and yeah, we've made some incredible progress in terms of life expectancy and not dying from horrific plagues and things like that, sure. But there's been a lot of progress or progress, I should maybe say uh, for you guys. Um, but hopefully my accent is endearing to anyone listening. Um, and, and the progress that's happening is actually counter to our biology. And so what happens over time, and we see this uh, in the X generation, the Y generation, as they hit their late 20s and 30s, uh, we see it with the baby boomers happening in their 60s and 70s. We see it with our kids, unfortunately, in that next generation. Everybody's body is just going time flipping out. I can't do this anymore. You know, I've got this incredible organ, the liver, and it's this amazing processing machine and it knows how to send this stuff that way, this stuff that way, produce a bit of this, make a bit of that. But we're producing, we're, we're surrounding it through what we put in our mouths, through what we put on our skin, through what we breathe in in our homes, our homes by the way that we're living in and spending time in, in quantities of time greater than ever before in the past. We used to be outside a heck of a lot more. And all of these things are happening to us now that weren't. And so our beautifully designed systems are just freaking out. And I mean, you know, autoimmune conditions is probably the best example of that. We are freaking out. Our livers are getting clogged up. We're starting to have to look at how we can optimize them. We're starting to have to do all these detox protocols. No one needed to do a detox protocol 200 years ago. You know, we just needed to know what the poisonous plants were and the non-poisonous plants were and kill an animal every now and then for a feast and we were good. So it's a much more complicated world and that is why we need to become literate. Uh, you know, often at um, talks, someone will put their hand up and they'll say, I always get this from my mother-in-law or my father-in-law or my mother, my grandparents. We never had to worry about any of this in our day. 
But I mean, if you take something like the humble McDonald's fry and you look back to pre-1984 when I used to go as a kid, it was cooked in grass-fed beef tallow. Mm -hmm. Now a McDonald's fry is 19 different ingredients. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure there's no grass-fed beef tallow in that ingredient list. Um, hydrogenated oils, strange perfecting thing, you know, lethal uh, herbicides that farmers have to close themselves up inside their house for a couple of weeks after they've sprayed the fields. Uh, some really horrific stuff. So I think the McDonald's fry is a great little example. Or you look at um, a, a Laffy Taffy, and you think about the original Laffy Taffy and there were no genetically modified soybean uh, uh, ingredients in that original Laffy Taffy. So everything's changed based on all of these things that we've added in and we call it progress, but unfortunately it's just progress for profit and not for the health of humans or our planet. So that's why we're struggling and that's why we need to get a bit of literacy around what these toxins are in our food, what they are in our environment, what they even are in the interiors we choose to furnish our homes with and and just choose better it's really that simple so it's not scary i hate fear mongering it's really just about learning a better choice that can be made with all of our daily choices yeah i think it comes down to your overall toxic load that you're you're placing mm. upon yourself when the load gets too heavy then you start to have issues i'm specifically talking about thyroid we know that you know, it's the load that your body takes on. And then eventually when it can't accommodate anymore, you're going to start to have those stressors that can affect cellular resistance and you start to get thyroid symptoms. And so being aware and knowing what that load is, there's a lot of things in our environment that we, we honestly can't change. And so you want to work on the things that you do have control over and stop stressing about the ones you don't have control over. Mm. And I think food, you know, gets harped on, but it, it's one of the easiest things that you have control over and so yeah. can you speak to, we know that real food is probably the, the best choice, but what are some of the big food additives or the way that things are packaged that can cause major toxicity in the body? Great question. And uh, you mentioned the word packaging, so I'll start. Uh, a lot of our pantry staples, for example, are packaged in soft plastics. Soft plastics often contain BPA and they often contain phthalates, P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S for the nerds out there who like taking notes and checking in on things um, afterwards. Um, but these plasticizers mimic the structures of natural hormones, right? And they have a disruptive effect on the entire endocrine system, which of course includes our thyroids. And uh, the... The, the crazy thing is with the science scientists who are researching things like BPA and phthalates, it is impossible to see it play out in the exact same way from one individual to the next, because if you're talking about endocrine disruption, it's going to affect one individual very differently to the next based on our genetics, our epigenetics. Uh, and a multitude of other factors. Uh, and so this is why some people are often much more susceptible and much uh, weaker to all of these environmental toxins than other people sometimes. You know, like you get un great Uncle Joe, who's like 92, smokes all day, every day, drinks like half a bottle of gin and like he's right as rain. But then you get like the wife who passed away at 65 from breast cancer. So, you know, two totally different um, experiences based on how those two bodies respond to toxicants in their environments or their food. So um, the BPA and the phthalates in soft plastic packaging are a shocker. And if you're in a family who still microwaves their food, maybe you're doing that in a plastic bowl. I mean, heat and plastic are not friends. And not only do we have to think about the microwave in that picture, but we also have to think about transportation trucks. And, you know, the US is as big a country as Australia is. And think about these trucks carrying like bottles of, you know, like the um, Tetra Pak um, stocks and broths or maybe almond milk in Tetra Packs. And so the in, inner layer is a soft plastic to make it waterproof, right? Even though it looks like a carton of cardboard on the outside that's maybe been waxed, right. um, there is plastic in there. 
And that truck is driving along a highway in the middle of the summer, you know, hot sun beaming down. So it's being microwaved in there too. And what happens when plastic and, um, and, and something inside the plastic spend time together, thanks to the heat, things start to leach out of those um, packagings into the food. So heat is one of the major ways, but the other way is also time. So if you actually just say have a packet of something sitting there in your pantry for a few months before you use it, time is also um, a factor in plastics leaching into our foods. So for me, plastics and foods, wherever we can possibly, even if your favorite brand comes in plastic, get it home, chuck it in a glass canister, a nice flip top jar or something like that. And that's how you keep it once it's in your house. Um, but we really want to try and minimize the amount of plastic we use. Definitely want to stop using plastic wrap around our foods, that stretchy, super thin stuff. Um, that's some of the highest uh, containing um, endocrine disruptive chemicals in those sorts of really soft, stretchy, shiny plastics. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, that would be the major one with, with how we're exposed to this stuff in our food. Yeah. So the big challenge is, yeah, and when we're talking about the, the, the products you're buying, I mean, you're, and you're talking about, hey, we've got plastics, they leach into the system. Uh, no, that's not on the label, right? So no, no. What's on the label, we're not really taking a look at what's in the packaging. Where you know, you, we're saying five minutes to cook, gluten-free, right. yeah. you know, and you think, oh, this is amazing. It's exactly what I need, but we're right. not thinking big picture. And so we see those things. And as you're talking about the trucks, you know, you, you know, the, one of those things we drink the most, you know, where there's water, right. And we've mm. got, you know, cartons and cartons and cases and cases of bottled water sitting in a hot truck for days, yeah. maybe, or in a warehouse and it's just getting heated up and all those chemicals leaching in. And we're thinking, Hey, I'm drinking plenty of water, not realizing uh, what's in that water. And if you look at the company's thing, they'll tell you, Hey, this is all clean. You, you know, mm -hmm. it's all tested. Uh, because it's been tested before it sat in that plastic container for exactly you know a period of time. So we've got chemicals that are leaching into our into our life from all all, all different aspects, right? And the challenge mm -hmm. is, and I think we started kind of talking about that before, which is okay. So before you freak out, right? Because you you can't escape it. I think the goal is to try and minimize the load, right? And so one of That's those exactly right. You were just kind of talking about was hey if you're not going to eliminate it all, but if this is your favorite food, eliminate the load. How do I eliminate the load uh, is by, hey, if I this thing comes in plastic, I'm not going to let it sit for more time in plastic. I'm going to kind of get it into something where I'm, I'm going to get less exposure. Mm -hmm. So from a, from a load exposure, if we had somebody who is like listening to this saying, I have thyroid issues, I have health issues, um, what where do I start, right? Am I starting with um, and what, what would what would be some of those kind of the tools or guidelines that you would give somebody? I got, I eat. Do I start with my food? Do I start with my home? Do I move out of my house? Do I start with my water? Do I start with my beauty products? If you were starting with somebody who's you know naive to the whole idea that there are all kinds of toxins in almost everything, can't get rid of them. Where would you have somebody just kind of start so they don't freak out? Because I think we've all seen that, right? You start mm, to tell somebody, absolutely. hey, yeah. what's in your shampoo? What's in your skin products? What's in your food? And they're like, well, oh, forget it then. I mean, I, I'm not doing anything. Exactly right. It's or, so true. Or they have the other issue. Well, I'll just do a detox. Well, mm. what, are you, what are you detoxing? I mean, if you're filling the sink up, right? And then you're, you're exactly. draining a little bit of stuff out, you're, you're still going to have a flood. So the cheapest way to detox, and I think you lean to that, is stop putting the load in and then let the body do because the body's a pretty cool thing it can handle a lot of stuff yeah so how would you give people like initial recommendations of where to start without getting overwhelmed great so my number one tip to just cap off from the food section is to think about how many products you buy and think about how much produce you buy and put your products on one side of the scale and put your produce on the other side of the scale. And we want to try and tip the scale to produce and make it less and less products over time. So and before they, so before they freak out about mm, organic, non-organic. Exactly. Forget all that for now. If so you are eating a lot of products, 
that's where we need to work first. Then you can look at how you cook it, where it comes from, all of that kind of stuff. And I know we don't have huge amounts of time today, but I will say that much. Just focus on getting great produce. And if you can get to a farmer's market, even once a month, just drive and get that connection happening with your farmer, it will change your life. It really, really does just remind you of good, wholesome values and start to appreciate what's on your plate more because we've stopped appreciating cooking and what's on our plate completely. It's just eating is this thing we got to get done. You know, it's beneath us to cook. Uh, and then from there, I would really look at the pillow next because we spend eight hours well, hopefully, right. <laughs> especially if we're looking after our thyroids, uh, like squished right into that thing and breathing it in night after night. Uh, I don't even know how many breaths we managed to take in eight hours, but it's a lot. And if we have got an old pillow or if we're breathing in microplastic dust because we've got a polyester pillow, uh, maybe we can't be bothered drying our hair before we go to bed sometimes. So we just go to bed with a wet head of hair onto the pillow and we've started growing molds and fungi in that other fungi in that pillow. Um, or maybe we haven't had that pillow see the, the light of day and get some sunshine on it in over two years. And we have a dust mite infestation in that pillow. So there's a number of reasons why I truly believe that our pillows are an extremely important part of our toxic load because of how reliably night after night we spend a very intimate and long amount of time with them. Um, check your pillow and switch it to a natural fibred pillow. Maybe go for a pure natural latex. Maybe go for wool. Um, wool can be contentious depending on the person, uh, as can latex is about one in a hundred of us have latex allergies. So it may take a couple of goes. Um, the best thing you can do in a store is to just sniff some of the trial ones and see if you have any alarm bells go off for you. I personally am a huge fan of an aerated latex pillow. It has lots of holes in it, keeps lots of air coming through the pillow. Um, the only thing with latex is you definitely don't want to sun it because sun breaks latex down. Uh, so just a bit of shade and outside, a bit of air once a fortnight, once a month, um, keeps your latex pillow in mint condition. Uh, and then um, vacuuming it with a HEPA filter. So that helps you actually clean the pillow out and it also cleans anything that comes out of that pillow but we don't spend enough time thinking about our pillows and it's not to freak everybody out. I'm sure there might be a few people like ferociously Googling <laughs> new pillows like while we're talking here, but it's just a fantastic win, right? And who doesn't like shopping for a nice little bargain they find on the internet and, uh, and just, you know, treat yourself to a pillow as, as your next um, big change because it'll really change I mean, you know, and with with the background you have, Eric, you, you want people sleeping on good pillows for their spine, um, never mind all the toxicity. So it really is just one of the most fantastic key things you can do for both your physical health um, uh, from a structural perspective as well as your um, toxicity load. And then the next one I really think is water. Uh, and, and really, I mean, water probably comes above your pillow if, I, if I'm to think about it. But because we just drink litres and litres, it's even more intimate than being against, it's actually going inside us. So it's right up there with our food choices. And I mean, you would know, of course, guys, that thyroid and iodine, um, you know, pretty important relationship, but then fluoride and iodine are on a little seesaw together. And if we have too much fluoride, then our iodine can dysregulate and we can end up in deficiency. Uh, you know, I don't care what, what side of the fluoride debate people are on out there. Please just do your own research. For me personally, uh, I came to realize that while I'm happy to have naturally occurring fluoride containing foods from soil, as it is balanced out by nature, I definitely don't feel comfortable being force medicated fluoride um, at levels that I haven't been able to in any way, shape or form test are safe for my body. 
And, uh, and if you look at some of the toxicity reports around neurotoxicity, IQ in certain populations that are being tested, as well as the thyroid epidemic, uh, I think we have like something like 20 million Americans diagnosed every year with some sort of thyroid issue. Folks, that ain't normal. You know, we've got to start looking at some of the things that are competing with the key nutrients that our thyroid requires. And for me, fluoride is just it's right there in the science, one of the big ones. So if you can get a great water filter, uh, I think that's just going to go such a long way. I know you guys have the Berkey brand in the US. That's a great water filter. Waters Co. is another favorite of mine. There are some really great options these days. And not only are you filtering out the fluoride in some of those fluoride removal systems, but you're also able to then remove pesticide runoff, herbicide runoff, other things that impair our thyroid function. Flame retardant uh, runoff. We know that flame retardants compete um, with, I think they actually prevent T4 from being transported in the blood. That's found in trace uh, in our water, um, most tap waters. So yeah, the, the water, the pillow, those are two really big wins we can make. And just on, on the point of budget, because a lot of families struggle with the, oh, hold on, they're telling us to buy like brand new pillows for the whole family. We've got six kids, like that's not going to be easy. This water filter costs 400 bucks. Well, how am I going to find that money? Channel your birthdays and, and Christmases really, really strategically from now on if you have budget issues. I can't tell you the amount of things I've been able to swap over to by saying, I don't want your pretty little scented candles or your token hand cream, whatever else it is you're going to try and give me just to tick the box and say, we got Alex something for Christmas. I want a $20 store voucher for this place because I'm trying to pull it all together and get something I really, really need for the house. And, you know, don't be shy. Like I even send specific product links to my mother. <laughs> So, you know, if you don't have to try and do it all alone on the budget that you're on, you can get a bit creative around present gift giving um, holidays as well. And I think those are three, like, three, you know, food, eat the best food you can afford to buy, right? And start tipping the scale, the, the, the scale towards healthy, real food before you start worrying about whether it's organic, non-organic, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Second thing, if we talk about water, uh, definitely that's a key thing. And you talked about the fluoride, but, you know, it, it is all the stuff in the runoff. There's chloride, there's bromine, there's all these things. Absolutely. And I think, I don't, ewg.org, at least in the U.S., I mean, if you go there and put in your zip code, it'll tell you what's in the water and mm, you'd be surprised. it can and, be scary and yeah. the chlorinated products are like those are the things they don't get much attention but those are the things they're dumping in to kind of clean things disinfect things and those mm -hmm. the chlorinated products will disrupt thyroid physiology as well almost all there's all those chemicals that you're seeing that you're seeing in the water have the ability to disrupt the endocrine system especially thyroid so they'll decrease iodine transport into the into the tissue they will uh decrease the thyroid binding globulin, they'll disrupt thyroid peroxidase, they, they will cause conversion issues, they'll decrease transport uh, into the cell, they will increase the deiodinase 3 activity. And so every aspect of thyroid physiology can be impacted by these things. And so where somebody might say, a oh, water filtration system, what's the big deal? I'll just use the carbon filter on my refrigerator that still may not be good enough to get all this stuff out. And you know, you think about it, you know, well, it's expensive well, to, compared to what, right? So what's more mm. important than your health? And yeah, you may not be able to buy cases of on cases of plastic water bottles. But if you that if you just said, listen, I'm not going to buy cases of water bottles or plastic water bottles, A, you're saving the environment to some degree, right? Yay, good. You're saving yourself. And you can yeah. put that kind of money into just a better filtration system and get the best one that you can afford. And if you use a, an ewg.org like zip code searcher, and I think you guys could probably use that same concept down there and find out what's in your water supply, what's been found, and then get the appropriate filter for, for that. Absolutely. Right? I mean, you guys have had some disasters um, in Flint and now uh, somewhere else I was just reading about on the news with the lead levels. I mean, lead and thyroid function, another disaster. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, one of the best tests you can run is just to look at the metals going on in your body because lead, cadmium, mercury, aluminum, all of them 
impair an impact on thyroid function. Uh, and, you know, so often we're just thinking, oh, poor me, you know, I've got this thyroid thing. I guess I'm just going to have to take these meds. There's so much you can investigate before. Well, of course, you've got to take your, your SOS plan, but right. your long game is your investigative journey, um, which we can treat really excitedly and curiously. Like, how am I going to move the needle on this in the long term? Mm -hmm. And these are the things that make the biggest impact, right? Because we're mm. trying to fix a thyroid. You're never going to fix a thyroid unless you reduce the, the, the stressors, right? If That's you, right. So we're always worried about how do I fix my, my skin issue, my gut issue, my thing. I got to take antimicrobials. I got to take this. I got to take that. But in the, the big scheme of things, even though it's not sexy, is it's the stuff in, that we're putting into us and around us that creates the dysfunction. Our thyroids are trying to hang on, right? Mm. They're, they're, they're realizing that, hey, there's a stressor going on here. We got we to gotta shift the physiology of how we work because we got this toxicity issue. We got to put a lot of time into addressing the stress or this threat. And if we're constantly bombarding the system, yeah, GI tract's going to break down. Why do you think it's breaking down? Because we're putting all these toxicants into a system and we're, as, as Erica said, the load is just becoming excessive and we can't yeah. manage the load anymore and systems are breaking down. It drives that kind of that cell danger response. And when we have excessive cell danger, then we're going to be more focused on cell defense, inflammation, making antioxidants and trying to fight exactly. versus growing new tissue or new hair or, or having a good bowel movement or good hormones. I mean, who needs sex when you're trying to fight, you know, fight the tiger or whatever? I mean, you know, exactly. I mean, the issue <laughs> is, the body I don't know about you, Mary, but <laughs> you don't, but we do, right? So the, uh, so I think those key things are important, and you know what? And we talk about like toxicity from the environment, but I, I you know, thinking about the pillow and what you said there, I mean, you know, you're, I think, I mean, even if you couldn't you know, somebody might say, well, what about my mattress? Mm. Take steps, right? You're saying, hey, start with the pillow. That's where your face is first, right? So start yeah. with that as a small step. And then maybe you could go to the pillow, right? And, and then, then maybe the mattress, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. one of the baby steps, like, because a lot of people might just have bought, like invested in a $3,000 mattress last year and not thought about this. And now they're going, oh, great. Now I got to spend another three grand. No, maybe consider a mattress topper made out of pure wool or latex. And that at least just kind of creates a natural fiber barrier that you're directly sleeping on. Uh, I, would, I would say there is always a lower budget, less freaky Audi uh, version of something you can do to move forward. And I think if we just stay focused on that positive realization that there's always something we can do, um, then, you know, it's great. You know, a lot of people like, oh my gosh, I've just found out my hand wash and my soaps and the antibacterial stuff that I use on my teenagers, acne and all of it has this triclosan in it and it's bad for the thyroid. Well, yes, it is. But what could we use instead? Good old fashioned bar of soap. You know, in fact, I think it was the EPA over in the States in 2016 or 15 that issued a challenge to scientists to prove once and for all that triclosan actually did do more than just soap and water. Mm -hmm. And no scientists could prove it. So they actually started that you guys are in the process by the end of this year, I think, of banning it out of antibacterial sanitizer type products. Mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic. We haven't even got that far in Australia. So hopefully we'll take a leaf out of your book there. Um, what, but that's One of the things that's crazy, right, is we spend tons of money trying to wash our hands and put this mm -hmm. on. In the meantime, we're put, dumping all, th all kinds of toxins in the food that we eat and the water we drink. And we're not, you know, that, that stuff gets less attention, right? And we're putting the stuff, we're worried about the bacteria on the outside of our skin versus the, the stuff that's floating around in our, in our, in our food supply. So mm, the antibacterial myth movement has a, a lot to answer for. And largely, like if you look at how that whole thing played out, it was marketers creating a problem that we didn't know existed so that we could go, oh my gosh, there's this problem. And then they could look like they'd come in and save us with all this amazing stuff that's 99.9% .9 killing bacteria. And then we think, amazing you guys are totally helping us out with this new problem that we have 
you never had a problem. Soap and water, the science is there. It does just as good a job. In fact, I had a nurse reach out to me who works in theatre with a surgeon and she was saying they always use the stuff that the hospital supplies, which is full of junk, endocrine disruptors, parabens, triclosan, like the, the works, except when there is a really high risk patient, they're all asked to use soap and water. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that crazy? That is crazy. And the, one I of the interesting things is, kidding me. one of the interesting thing is when you're using a lot of those, like, for example, Clorox wipes or even some of these, you know, high chemical cleaners, you think that you just wipe the surface and, you know, it kills everything. But if you actually read the bottle, it says that you need to keep that surface wet for at least mm. 10 minutes. Like you need to be wiping that same surface for 10 minutes <laughs> for that to be effective. And who yeah. has the time to do that? And then, then you're leaving all those chemicals on there that are going to reduce your immune system. So if there was bacteria, you're, you're that much more susceptible to, to getting you know, sick or causing issues in your body. So it's, it's crazy that we use these products that are full of chemicals and we're not even using them right when soap and water could have done the exact same thing even better. Exactly right. And then the soap and water doesn't upset our skin microbiome our inner microbiome, our lungs, our eyes, you know, all of those chemicals. And I don't want to poo-poo all chemicals. I hate the term chemical-free because that's a huge misnomer. I mean, if you had a glass of water, beautiful filtered water this morning, you enjoyed a cocktail of chemicals. There are many good chemicals. So, um, but really to realise the ones that are uh, disturbing our natural processes, our natural biomes, uh, is huge. I mean, you know, Dr. Zach Bush has done a lot of work to, to raise awareness on the critical importance of our microbiomes. And, uh, and I love that return to nature, that return to stop, stop being scared of microbes because just like good chemicals, there are a ton of good microbes and we need them to be healthy. We need them to have healthy immune responses. So, yeah, I think just returning to that basic soap to water is one of the most liberating things you can do and often is a major cut down of plastic for people in their homes, which so many of us are trying to do naturally to do our part for the environment these days. So a good old bar soap is, is definitely the way forward. And I do just want to mention um, one more really good win that we can make, which is from our kitchens as well, which is our cookware. So a lot of us are familiar with the promises that Teflon made to be this fantastic miracle non-stick surface that things could just glide right off. But the technology uh, is really quite harmful. And the PFOAs and PTFEs, the kind of newer, slightly greener cousin of the original um, Teflon technology, are uh, really, really harmful to us and also impair thyroid function um, through breathing it in through the gases that come off in, in high heat. I mean, what do we do with frying pans, right? We heat things up fast and on high heat. So things off gas. And if you look in the veterinary journals, there is actually evidence to show that birds can be killed instantly breathing this kind of gas in and they discovered that from budgies kind of that lived in like little cages in people's kitchens and you just think wow like how is this even legal let alone sold as some wonderful thing for us to have to make our breakfast eggs easier to slide right off the pan and again just as we're returning to that soap and water we're returning to grandma's beautiful cast iron pans. We're learning how to season them properly. And guess what? Your eggs slide right off. So uh, I think you know, one of the most beautiful things about going low tox is that it's actually going old school half the time and just simplifying things. So while it might seem complicated that we've got to develop a, a new hate relationship with a lot of the stuff we've been using, the, on the other side, once we get over that, whoa, everything's just about to change, is how simple everything becomes. And in fact, I've found it to be a cost negative journey rather than a costly one because you just you stop buying into all the marketing messages. You keep a hold of your basics. You buy things like cast iron pans that last centuries. Uh, and it comes back to buy less, buy once, buy well, 
those old school um, kind of wartime adages that don't sound so trendy and certainly don't make a huge amount of profits for big uh, companies. But at the same time, they make our lives pretty easy and way, way less uh, of a toxic burden than they are right now. So we, we, we go on for a couple more hours, but I know we're on a tighter schedule today. So you've actually put out a book, Low Toxic mm-hmm. Life, right? So if some, until we get you back on the podcast, if somebody wanted more information on how to work on detox, detoxifying their life, is the Low Tox Life book, is that, that's a great resource. It doesn't matter where you're at, right? US. Does not matter where you're at. It is an international um, book and I wrote it very specifically to be able to kind of help people choose their own adventure. You pick a page, any page, any topic, you've got some really sweet little tips on how to swap from what to what, Um, but it's not brand specific. But then all throughout the book, we have the resources uh, URL that you then jump onto the Low Tox Life website and you have your country and a few different options for where US, UK, Canada, New Zealand, I think as well. And we're just about to add a couple of European countries, France um, and Spain. So um, plenty of, of, of resources there. If people, uh, and it, look, it really is great and it'll make you feel comfortable and excited rather than freaked out and terrified. Because I think the more freaked out and terrified we are, the less we tend to act because it's like too hard basket. I'm just going to ignore all of that. Uh, and, uh, and then we stop. So I'm big, big, big on helping people feel like there's always something we can do and that's exciting rather than terrifying. And here, here's how easy it is. So you've got a lot of nice little DIY recipes. If you're a bit of a, a homesteader and you really like making your own stuff, that's in there. Otherwise head to the website and then you've got some country resources. But if you feel like you need a bit of help, you know, sometimes we all just love getting into groups and kind of doing it together and doing a challenge. I do run the Go Low Tox course twice a year that I personally coach for five weeks. And, uh, and that is stepping through absolutely every part of daily life with a ton of resources and personal question and answer with me every single day. I think the next one's coming up in October, if anyone was interested in doing that one. Yeah, and the website's a great resource. There's tons of great information on the website, so you can get that information there. I would say the book, that's not Audible, is it? No, unfortunately, because there are so many recipes in it, right. Audible didn't uh, take it on because we would be saying, oh, um, and here's me reading out a recipe. So that was a bit awkward. <laughs> You'll have to actually, you can get the e-download though if you don't want to waste paper. I know there's a lot of people who are eco-conscious these days um, and that's available on Amazon and Book, De- Book Depository as well. Yeah, I'm a big Audible person because I can listen to everything. I know, I love it too. And actually the next book I'm writing is a a black and white, like kind of read it type book. So I'll be able to record that one, which will be fun. You get through a ton, but I I was just, I was going to say to the listeners and the viewers that, hey, this is probably a book that's best purchased like versus Audible because there's so many resources there and links and all those things. This would be probably, it's probably one of those things. So since it's, it's either the e-download or the book, I think that's probably the best way to get it, but it's a great resource. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. And so I think if you have that type of resource, even if you're a, a doctor, a nutritionist, a physician, you know, functional medicine practitioner, and you need, I mean, this can take up hours of patient time. Right. And can, so- or you can be left feeling like I can't even like, I'm never going to be able to get all of this across to them. So it can be one of those like prerequisite readings for working with a patient. Often I find a lot of uh, physicians and naturopaths get in touch and say, thank you. I give this to all my patients. Right. You can hand that out and say, Hey, here, look, go through this. If you have questions, let me know. Focus on chapter. 10 today, you know, mm. for this week and, and kind of work on this strategy. So it kind of lays a groundwork for, to help people out. So I know in our, in my patients, you know, once you start talking about detoxing their life, they're starting to, you know, <laughs> eyes get big and, and, you know, and then what do I do? And, you know, there, a book like yours is a great resource. It's kind of giving you kind of more of a, kind of a personal experience or, and there's things like EWD, uh, environmental workers group, which is a great resource as well. Nice. Tons of stuff. And there's, you know, but as, as Alex said, I mean, the big challenge is the toxins in our life. 
Uh, you're not gonna escape them all. So what you wanna do is you wanna just start easy and slowly so you don't uh, tip yourself into a, a panic. And then you start just kind of chipping away. And I think the food, go to whole food first, worry about organic, non-organic second. Uh, then once you get to more eating more whole foods, then you can start looking at the dirty dozen, the clean 15 and those types of mm -hmm. things. Focus on your water. You know, water is, is massive nourishment and there's so much benefit from getting good quality, clean water. And uh, if you can't do that, then uh, get, a, get a filtration system or the best type of filtration system for your situation or that you can afford. I think that's a, a good option. And then the two other things that you said, I think are things that, you know, most people don't even consider, which is what they lay and spend six, seven, eight hours or more in every night. Uh, huge thing, start with the pillow or the topper, another great uh, uh, um, suggestion. And then the last one, the cookware, I mean, how many people, you know, they'll, that's one of the things they do is try to nourish themselves each day. And yet they're maybe using cookware that is toxic to them and putting more of that toxic. <laughs> you're spending all this money on good quality food and then you put it into something that just makes it more of a toxicant, right? And more problematic. So I think those are like awesome tips for anybody who's listening is to kind of start with those processes. I urge anybody to kind of go to Low Tox Life, check the website out, get the book. And uh, definitely, we'd love to have you back on and kind of continue this conversation again, because we really didn't get far enough. I know, we can go for hours on these I, things. And, and I, I actually, it'd be really great if a few people who maybe listen to today's show have some questions, and then we can kind of dive into some popular questions from your audience, because I think that's when the juicy stuff happens, when you say, okay, I get what I need to do. This is why I'm still challenged. What do I do? You know, I think that's always really cool to to dive like we did for for our show. Yeah, and this is it'd be good because this is we did a podcast uh, earlier in the week on iodine and thyroid physiology, and and we talked a little bit about some of the toxicants, and we're probably going to do another one. We talked about doing one on fluoride and maybe some of these other chemicals and how they really impact the system. Maybe ways to evaluate and check them out. So this will be a good sandwich in between. So. We nice. appreciate having you on. Erica, uh, any questions or final comments for Alex? No, I just think that this is a really important topic where people really, really struggle. And um, I just, I again, I have a million questions more that we could <laughs> obviously go through. So definitely need to bring you back on so we can uh, get through some of those. Yeah. yeah, great. We'd love to come back. So the simple thing for everybody listening, work on the, e the things that are easier to control, the things that you have the most control over is your food, your water, how you cook, and what you sleep on. You have control of those. Don't worry about the magic supplement that's going to detox you first. Worry about these things first before you try to do the next detox um, thing that you read on the web or the podcast. Or, or say, hey, take these 18 supplements and they'll help <laughs> detox you. Worry about this stuff first. There's really a, not a negative to eating better, drinking more water, sleeping on better stuff and cooking in safe cookware. So we'll end with that. Alex, thank you so much. We'll get you back to or on to sleep, I guess. And we've got to get our day started here. So thank you so much for coming on and, and we can't wait to have you back on again. Thank you Absolute for coming on. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody, we'll wrap this up. And if you are a listener of Thyroid Answers Podcast, please go to iTunes or wherever you watch the podcast. Give us a nice review, especially the one with Alex, five star, right? And then uh, <laughs> if you have questions uh, regarding anything you hear, reach out to us uh, wherever you listen to the podcast or reach out to Dr. Erica or myself and give us any questions. And I'll, Alex, I'll put all your contact information uh, in with the show notes, okay? All right, awesome. we'll sign off. Thank Take you. Care, you guys have a great day. Bye.